we found that plants can actually make nitriles too. Mike Aburo and Uta Wittstock, who were in my group, um, showed that actually plants can, um, can produce nitriles. And what happens in Arabidopsis is when pyaris is feeding on it, um, and the pyaris is metabolizing glucosinolates into nitriles, then the plant starts producing nitriles as well. So you get a big increase in production of nitriles from both sides. So we really wondered why the plant was bothering to do this as well. Um, and what it turned out is we found that when we did assays with adult females and oviposition, and this is, um, um, we, well, it took a while to really figure out what was going on. There were no differences in the survivorship of pyaris on different lines of isothiocyanate or nitrile hydrolyzing Arabidopsis. When we allowed the females to oviposit, we found that they preferred ovipositing on plants with ice producing isothiocyanates instead of nitriles. So although the isothiocyanates are more toxic compounds in general to organisms, the insects preferred to oviposit on these plants than the nitrile plants. And the reason we think is because if you're a cabbage butterfly and you sniff nitriles, this compound coming off a plant, what that may mean is that there's another cabbage white caterpillar, another pyaris caterpillar on the plant, because these are nitriles are volatile. These are produced um, as metabolites of glucosinolates. And so sniffing nitriles suggests to the mother that there's another larva on the plant, and that's why she avoids ovipositing there. And the plant is exploiting this to drive away ovipositing butterflies. A second argument for this of what nitriles might be has to do with defenses of enemies of herbivores. And uh, this is, um, um, and there are a number of insects parasitoids which attack herbivores. Um, and these wasps, such as Cotesia rubecola here, are, is a specialist on um, pyrus rapi caterpillars. Um, what we did is we, so we used this insect, we put, took Arabidopsis plants, um, allowed caterpillars of pyrus rapi to feed on them, and then we ended up with. Um, looking to see where in a wind tunnel these wasps flew. And these are enemies of the caterpillar. And it turned out that they were most attracted to plants with nitriles versus isocyanates. So our interpretation here, again, is that the nitriles are a signal that they know that these, these plants have caterpillars on them. And the plant is producing nitriles of its own to sort of amplify the signal and let these herbivore enemies know hey, I've got a caterpillar here, a lot of nitriles here, come get it. And so this may be have evolved really as a strategy by plants, the production of nitriles to increase the attraction of enemies. So I'm, I'm almost at the end here. I just wanted to really just clear a quick wrap with some of the main conclusions. I hope I've convinced you that uh, um, we are learning more and more about how glucosinolates can act in defense. Um, which suggests a little bit more that they do have a defensive role in plants. I started out by telling you a little bit about how um, the toxicity of glucosinolates, rather than resulting from this reaction with proteins that's seen in the textbook, um, we believe is really due to uh, excessive detoxification reactions, reaction with glutathione. Um, and I think this kind of result reminds us that we have to be used to unexpected things. We can't just take data from the literature about the mode of toxicity of a plant specialized metabolite on a, an animal or on humans or on microbes. We have to really investigate how this works in insect herbivores to really understand the mode of action on these compounds. Um, the second point I hope I made is to show you that some insects really feed without any problems on plants containing glucosinolates, and they do have some um, metabolism of glucosinolates, we showed in, in this work that uh, this, um, what the diamondback moth does, this desulfation is a genuine detoxification process. And again, here showing that these metabolism of glucosinolates is our real detoxification it helps us assure that these compounds are likely to be defenses because it seems like certain adapted herbivores go out of their way to metabolize them. Um, and then the third part, I really showed you how plants can get back at, at herbivores that can then metabolize their defenses by, for example, producing different kinds of defenses, um, producing mixtures, producing other defense compounds, perhaps, or attracting herbivore enemies. And when you think about uh, 
um, why we don't really see more insects dropping dead from feeding on plants, I think we have to realize that this kind of coevolution where plants make defenses and then insects counter adapt and then plants go back and make better defenses. This has been going on for millions of years and we are really, we're new on the scene. We're just looking at something that's been going on for a very long time. And if we don't really see defense in action of these compounds, it may be because most of the plants out there are really resistant to most herbivores and as the same sense, the herbivores themselves are in part resistant to a lot of the chemical compounds. So it may not always be easy to see the effects of defense um, of plants to, against insect herbivores in an immediate context. So I think it clearly calls for more research on this area. I think as we do more and more, we're finding out more, but this is not easy to prove that these are really defensive compounds in, in nature. There's a lot of experiments that have to be done with natural herbivores and natural plants to really show this. However, the exploitation of these compounds, obviously in agricultural situations or the use of these compounds pharmaceutically, is certainly something that we can do immediately. And in these situations, we really are, it's not clear what we can expect, but we might see far more biological activity than otherwise. So I think there's a long, um, bright future for working on plants, specialized metabolites in these contexts, because these are probably compounds that have been sharpened by evolution over the years in terms of acting as defenses. Um, okay, so before I conclude, let me just show you a picture of the people who did the work. Um, I really had a great group of people that have been working on this over the years. The Tuitela work I just described is the work of Ruo Sun and Daniel giddings Vassau and Sagar Pandit, again, really helped a lot, with, especially with this plant-mediated RNAi. The mode of action work is the work of Irene Yeshka and Daniel giddings Vassau. And the third story on Pyrus is really um, Micah Burrow and Uta Vichdok. Um, and these are some other collaborators over the years. I want a special shout out to Naveen Visht, if he's listening, who was really with Roshan Kumar, one, his student was really in our laboratory um, off and on over the years. And he worked on glucosinolate detoxification as well as on the biosynthetic side. And we've had a very nice collaboration. So um, thanks to all of them for doing the work and thanks to you for, for listening. And I hope I can uh, take questions. Thank you, Professor Gessensen, for a wonderful talk on how isothenates are uh, used in uh, uh, plant defense and how insects are uh, evolved to uh, detoxify them and how plants are readapting to uh, protect their uh, herbivores. It was a very nice talk. Now uh, the session is open for uh, questions. Dr. Pratish, there are some few questions in chat box. Can yes, you sir. Yes, sir. I'm just okay. Uh, you, you just check now. Sir, uh, there was a there was a question from uh, Dr. Navin Biz. Uh, uh, he was uh, telling, uh, can you comment on comment and compare on the best strategy to counteract the specialist herbivores in uh, brassica crops? Silencing of insect sulfates versus Manipulation of glucosinolate profiles versus overexpression of myrosinase. Okay, well, that's a that's a good question. How would we? What would be the best way to uh, to deal with a crop in terms of glucosinolate metabolism? Um, obviously, we think that this uh, plant that this with the success of plant mediated RNAi, then this bodes well for maybe oh. using that. I think this could be. In fact, could be directly sprayed on the field in, a, in, in, in the future and really directly target a pest like uh, the diamondback moth because it would specifically target its detoxification system and maybe not target any other insects that are likely to be there. Um, it's In this case also then increasing the level of glucosinolates in the crop plant would be beneficial because the balance between the detoxification and the defense compound then is critical. 
So I think in that case, we could actually put a number of defenses together um, in, in this, in this uh, as an approach. So increasing the glucosinolates, knocking out the, the detoxification system in the insect um, could be very useful. It's interesting that many people have used um, biocontrol of Plutella. People have studied how various enemies of Plutella are affected by the glucosinolates. And we've actually done some studies that we just published about the lacewing, um, which is considered to be a, a, a pest insect that has a value for biocontrol, um, the green lacewing, Chrysoperla carnea, and it's actually partially resistant um, to, uh, um, to the glucosinolates uh, as well, to the isothiocyanate. So we might actually be able to combine all approaches. I guess my, my, uh, it, my feeling is that we would, it's best to use an integrated approach and use several methods, maybe targeting the insect, increasing defenses in the plants, and bringing in enemies as well, and, and hope that that works, works the best. Um, it's hard to, it, I think it's bad to try and emphasize one approach exclusively. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, there was uh, another question from uh, Andrea. Uh, she's asking, uh, might also protein prenylation be distributed by isothiocyanate? Is protein prenylation? Wow! Well, I tell on Andrea, we need you to, to tell us that. I guess we met, looked at the levels of proteins, and uh, yeah, because of the chemistry involved, you might think that that could be affected as well. We we haven't. I'm afraid we haven't measured that at all. Um, but uh, if you wish, I'm happy to send you some samples. Thank you, thank you, Professor Gazan, for the wonderful talk. And there is one question, I guess. Okay. Can you can you read, Pragadish? Yeah. Uh, there are uh, two more questions. Uh, how did the math? Sulfatase evolved to use glucosinolates as a substrate. Good question. My colleague, Heiko Fogel, has actually published a couple of papers looking at the evolution of the gene family um, here. And there are three glucosinolate sulfatase genes in Plutella, actually. And theorize ancestor is a neural sulfatase activity which is fairly general in insects and metabolism. So he theorizes that that's really the ancestral gene. And this has been appropriated for um, then for metabolizing this uh, plant specialized metabolite. Um, and it's interesting because these three different genes and code enzymes have slightly different specialization as well. So this is more evident that the insect is actually evolving its detoxification activity with respect to the plant. Um, one of them particularly targets the endolic glucosinolates, one of them more on the aliphatic side, um, and the expression files are slightly different of these. They're all expressed in the mid-gut very highly, which is where you'd expect them to be in the insect in contacting the, uh, the, the glucosinolate. So yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, if you look at a couple papers from Heiko Fogel um, and Hannah Fischer, uh, the last year or two, they, they have published on a little bit on the evolution of this uh, Sulfatase in insect. Professor yeah. there is another question. Uh, they are asking uh, which other similar compounds are being studied by your lab? Metabolite yeah. of plant herbivore systems. Um, yeah, over the years, we've done a lot of work with, with terpenes. Um, we have with, with, with aphids, right? One of our big projects is with quinolizidine alkaloids, which are present in legumes, which are aphids. We've also worked with a number of other two-component defenses, such as the cyanogenic glycosides um, and benzoxazenoids as well. Benzoxazenoids present in uh, a number of grasses and the cyanogenic glycosides in uh, cassava, particularly with respect to herbivores. So we, we've, yeah, I'm afraid we're kind of a dilettante. I wander over a number of different areas, but... Uh, um, We've tried to sort of focus on plant herbivore interactions over the years. And glucosinolates have been one of the, one of the favorites, though, so it's, uh, it's nice to be able to talk about that. Thank you, Professor Gershenson.
mobile. I hope there is no more. Uh, I hope there is no other uh, questions. Thank you, Professor Gazazan. Uh, now, next. Uh, okay. Thanks very much, Dinesh. Okay. Yeah, certainly. I understand. Um, good luck. Thank you very much for organizing this. It was. I appreciate the chance to be able to talk and. Uh, Okay, now very, very good and good luck with the rest of the conference. Uh, Dr. Pragadesh.
sir can you can you see us yes yes okay Yeah. Uh, welcome back to the session. Uh, now we have uh, Dr. Shannon Olson. Uh, uh, Shannon is an assistant professor in the National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore. Her research focuses in how insects interact with their environment using chemical signals. Her group is interested in understanding how small networks like insect brains perform object identification and uncover the basic principles of complex sensory processing. Or to build artificial systems that employ robot control and smart sensors. So I take this opportunity to welcome Shen, my uh, postdoc uh, mentor, and uh, this was very pleasure to have Shannon here. Now we will uh, give the session over, over to uh, Shannon. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see. Okay, and you can hear me fine? Yes, we can hear. I hope. <laughs> um, can you let me know if you can hear me? Okay, okay, thank you. All right, then I will start. Um, hi, good morning or good afternoon. Actually, now it is a good, good afternoon, everyone. I've been trying to join since since actually morning. So for me, for me, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's a great pleasure to have been invited by both Dinesh and Pragadesh. I, I have really enjoyed working with them for a number of years since I've been in, at NCBS. And so today I'm going to talk about a slightly different topic, I think, than much of the conference is about. But I hope it provokes some thoughts uh, amongst our audience, amongst the researchers, that maybe you can incorporate some of this line of thinking into your own work, because I think it's a very, very important topic, especially for those of us living in, in India, but actually really across the world. And it's just the idea of how ecology exists within this current age we're in the Anthropocene. So the name of our lab is the Naturalist Inspired Chemical Ecology Lab. We are the NICE group, which is a catchy name, but it has a very important meaning. And that comes from the end, the beginning of the word NICE. It, it, it means that all of our research really starts out in nature. So chemical ecology is the study of how organisms use chemicals to interact with each other in the environment. I'm sure you know all about that from Jonathan's talk just now. And most of our work actually looks at the animal side, although we do, of course, look at plant metabolites as well as microbial metabolites as well. And since our work starts outside, we work all over India, from the shade-grown coffee plantations of Korg and Chikpangalur to black buck chemical communication in Rajasthan to high-altitude plant metabolism in Kashmir to studying pollination in the Himalayas. And, and through all of this work, one of the things that we've noticed when working outside is that our environments are changing very, very quickly. They're changing mainly because of how our, we humans are changing our environments. We're changing how the land is being used. We're changing the climate, as you know. We're changing pollution, water, air pollution, and soil pollution. We're also using a lot of chemicals uh, that are introducing them into the environment, fungicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, all of which are having a profound impact on the microbial plant and animal life around us. In fact, this picture was one of the things that instigated this 
Pragadish probably knows this in the area well because this is one of the areas where we did our research. But the next year when we came back to this field site, it didn't exist. It was completely removed and made into actually truly a parking lot, which is a really famous song from the, from the I believe, the 70s, um, Paving Paradise and Putting Up a Parking Lot. And that literally happened to this beautiful rhododendron uh, valley that we were in in, in, in North Sikkim. And we know this as the Anthropocene. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard this word many, many times. This is the, the new geological age that we find ourselves in that is entirely uh, categorized by a single species, which is humans. Humans are having such a profound impact on the world that we are affecting the very geology of, the, of our planet, which is why our geolo geologists have named this the new era called the Anthropocene. And, and I really, um, this is a, a, a somewhat painful or poignant image of Mumbai that I'm sure you all well know, but this is exactly what the Anthropocene is about. It's about Humans, our socioeconomic differences, our socio-political differences, and nature is caught right in the middle of those. And so when we think about understanding our environments, understanding our ecosystems, we also have to think about not only the ecosystems themselves, but how humans are having an effect on it. So our research really from the time that Pragadish was leaving the lab until now has really done quite a 180 and we're very much focused on this human impacts on our world. So today I want to tell you a, a couple of stories that do deal with plant metabolites but of course I'm going to mainly focus on the insect as aspects as in, in some of Jonathan's talk as well. And the first starts with this fact, which is that 40% of our insect pollinators are currently facing extinction. I'm sure you also know this. It's quite a bit in the news about this so-called insect apocalypse we are facing. And one of the things that we wanted to study was how our pollinators are actually coping with their environments across different parts of the world. So this is actually a really important issue for India itself because India is far and away the top fruit and fruit producer in the world. It dwarfs all other countries in terms of its fruit production. It is not the biggest exporter of fresh fruit. That actually, it's, it's I think a number 11 or so on that list, but that's because most of our fruits and vegetables stay domestic. They, they stay to feed us, feed you and me in, in India. And that's, that is very important for our food security. So pollination, which we know leads to fruit production, and this audience would know well, it becomes a very big issue if our, if our animal pollinators are being reduced. So Karen Nordstrom, who is now a professor at Flinders University in Australia, and I set out to understand how pollinators are actually locating their, their plants in various parts of the world. And we chose to focus on this particular little pollinator called the hoverfly. And the reason we chose it is that we were able to find it everywhere we looked. It's a cosmopolitan pollinator. This particular species, which is known as Episurphus baltiatus, is found all over the world. And these are pictures that I took with my own camera phone in, uh, in my uh, in where Karen used to be a professor, in Jena, where Jonathan is, that's right outside of the institute, in, uh, in NCBS, where I now am employed, and up in Sikkim. In fact, we found these pollinators at 4,000 meters in elevation. And it makes you wonder, right? I mean, the plants that they're going to be finding in all of these different environments are going to be extremely different, not only because of the different geographies, but also be, uh, because of the different pressures that they are under from the different environments and different ecosystems. So our question was, is how is the same pollinator able to find plants in these vastly different environments and, 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 uh, and climates? So we set about by watching these pollinators and we watched several species of hoverflies. Here's another species called Aristellus tenax, the drone fly. And what we did was we observed them in these different environments and looked at which type of flowers were they going to, which species were they going to, and what were the characteristics of those plants that they found attractive. In order to understand those characteristics, we had to measure them. So we measured a number of characteristics of the flowers. We measured the way the flower looks, of course, because the, the morphology, the pattern, the shape of the flower has an impact on pollinator preference. 
We also looked at the colors of the flower. We used a portable spectrophotometer to measure the reflectance of wavelengths from the flower, both in the visual spectrum and, of course, in UV, because most insects, in fact, I think almost all insects can detect UV cues, and we know that insect pollinators use UV cues to identify suitable flowers. So, we also looked at abiotic factors coming from the flowers, such as humidity and temperature and carbon dioxide, all of which have been found by other researchers, such as Rob Rugusa at Cornell University, to also be important for pollinators to locate flowers. And of course, being a chemical ecologist, we looked at the smell of the flowers, the volatiles that are being released using a technique that Pragadish helped develop in our lab with, uh, with PDMS, with a silicone tubing that we were able to suspend over the flowers without having to pick them and detect the volatile cues. So we put all of this information together and this was done by Pragadish and Shured in our lab. We had over a million different data points from colors and sizes and shapes and smells and temperatures, everything that I just mentioned. And they then asked using a multivariate statistics that was done by Josephine Dalgum in, in Uppsala, Uppsala University, what are the key characteristics that, that are attractive for a hoverfly in these different environments? Are they the same? Does a hoverfly in Sweden like the same kinds of cues as a hoverfly in Bangalore or a hoverfly in the Himalayas in Sikkim? Or are they different? And using the statistical approach, we were able to identify from the statistics key cues that seem to be very prominently attractive across these different environments and within these different environments. And because these cues were things like colors and shapes and sizes and smells, we could convert our statistical analysis into actual objects which we first used through paper models and then eventually resorted to 3D printing when we had a 3D printer in our lab. So these are what our statistical models look like. Each of these cues is, an, is a, 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 a flower that has been purported to be attractive in each of these different environments where we work. Now, as you can see, these aren't representative of real flowers because we weren't trying to mimic an actual flower like a rose or a daisy or a jasmine bloom. We were actually trying to replicate the cues from these flowers, which means that these models don't represent any real world flower at all. In fact, you can see they look quite weird. They look a little bit like Lego flowers. One of them is actually green, which of course no flower is actually green, but we just went by the statistics. We just did what the statistics told us. And lo and behold, our paper models and our 3D printed models too were very attractive in these environments, even though they weren't actually representative of exact flowers, which shows that we can recreate the cues artificially and put these in their different environments. But interestingly, we found that different types of cues were, were attractive in different environments. Not all cues were equally attractive. One set of cues, which you can see in this yellow shaped flower, did happen to be attractive. And since then, we've tested this flower in the United States and in Australia and even in South America, where we found it actually be attractive to hoverflies all over the world. So we do find some cues are universally attractive regardless of their environment. But other cues, like for example, this tiny blue flower was only attractive in Bangalore, which is really interesting because that also shows that the environment of, of the pollinator has an, an impact on what kind of cues it finds attractive. Not only on the production, the metabolism of those cues by the plant itself, as this, this conference will tell you about, but also by the perception of those cues by the pollinator. Now, we did our research, as I mentioned, in the Himalayas, and the Himalayas also has another very, very interesting attribute to it, and that it is very, very susceptible to climate change, as, as many of you well know. In fact, up to 90% of the glaciers that we currently find in the Himalayas are 
threatened to disappear by 2050 without climate action tech, action taking place. And even in the few years that I've been working in the Himalayas, I have seen profound changes happening because of climate change effects. It's happening faster in the Himalayas than almost anywhere else in the world. But the Himalayas itself serves as an excellent template to understand climate change. So for this work, I'm going to talk about Joyshi Chanam's work. She's a postdoc with Mahesh Sankaran, and she also worked with our lab on how climate change is affecting these flower cues that these pollinators are using. And actually, the Himalayas serve as an excellent petri dish for climate change, because while the altitude is changing rapidly, as you just go a few meters up, up the road in a place like Sikkim, that also serves as microclimate. So the average, average temperature decreases two degrees for every 500 meters you go up in elevation or down in elevation. And UV cues, nitrogen fixation, humidity, and all these other factors are also changing rapidly, which as we know, have a profound impact on both the production of secondary metabolites by the plants that they use to attract pollinators and also very likely on the pollinators themselves. So Joy Shree wanted to see if these differences in climates were having an effect on the plants. We chose four different flowers that are commonly found in the Himalayas and Sikkim particularly across different elevations. One is a strawberry blossom, gregaria. One is a buttercup in the anemone genus. One is bistrota and the other is lysmachia. So each of these flowers are commonly found in the early spring weather, right when these hoverflies and pollinators first start to come out. And she studied them at three different elevations from 300 to 3,000 to 4,000 meters in elevation. And she looked at how they were attracting the pollinators. And first she looked at the volatiles and what we found was something that I found very, very fascinating. As we know, volatiles are secondary metabolites of, of the plant and they are used by, among other things, to attract these pollinators. And we found that actually the same flower at different elevations was producing very, very different volatile blends. In fact, not only were they producing different concentrations of the blends, which you might, uh, you might imagine because of the change in air pressure and other factors, but they were producing different chemicals altogether. So it wasn't just the amounts, but the actual identities of the volatiles that were changing. And as you can see from this principal component analysis, we could easily separate the volatile blends by their elevation, which showed that each elevation flower actually smelled unique. And this made us wonder, well, could pollinators even tell this difference? Can they actually tell the difference between a, a 3000 meter flower and a 3500 meter flower? So to do this, we have to do one of two things. We either have to transplant the flowers, which also might also change how they smell because of course we're transplanting them to another elevation, or we could recreate that elevational flower and put that fake flower, the artificial flower at different elevations. So we resorted to our 3D printing technique. And as you can see on the right, here's what our artificial strawberry flower looks like. And we tried to replicate the cues as best we could and replicate the volatile cues of the particular elevation that, um, that we found uh, for that flower. So then we tested each of those elevations at all the elevations. In other words, when we were at 3,000 meters, we then put out our model flowers and the model flowers represented 3,000, 3,500 and 4,000. So every elevation was presented with every elevational flower blend. And we did in fact find differences that the pollinators do distinguish these volatile blends at all the different elevations and they don't necessarily prefer their own elevation. So you can see at the very final uh, Z uh, category here, at 4,000 meters when we tested our artificial flowers, the 4,000 meter replicate was actually less attractive than the replicates at 3,000 and 3,500. Now what we're doing is trying to understand why this is the case. What is making these floral volatiles change at these different elevations? And also what is changing the pollinator preference to them? So this is work that's being done by Gowrie uh, in, in our lab. She is a new graduate student. This is only her second year. So she's just been starting doing this. So you'll have to talk to me again in a couple of years when she's done with her thesis. 
So this is all work about uh, how pollinators and flowers are actually changing with our changing environment that we are we're having a profound effect on as humans. For the last part of my talk, I want to take you back to my home city of Bangalore, right, where we're actually Pragadesh and Dinesh and I all live. This is uh, this is what it looks like a lot of times when I go to work in the morning. This is Hebel. And Bangalore, as you know, has undergone profound changes in its population size over the past 20 years. It's now a mega city of 14 million. And in the 70s, it was only about 700,000 people. So it's a massive, massive increase in people. And along with a lot of people comes a lot of pollution. And as we also probably know, if you didn't, I want to congratulate you, those of you that live in India like me, that you now live in the most polluted country in the world. The 10 top most polluted cities, nine of them are actually found in India itself. So India has a, a lot of polluted cities. And as you look at these cities, some of them are the usual suspects like Delhi, but a lot of them are actually found in and around agricultural lands. So we wanted to know, is this pollution from the cities actually having any sort of effect on pollination as well? Because of course, pollution doesn't just stay in the cities. We all know that the Delhi pollution actually comes in many cases by winds that are bringing in burning biomass job as well, as well as also vehicular traffic and other in-city activities. So we know that pollution doesn't stay in one place. So therefore, pollution might also affect our pollinators. So we first did a back of the envelope sort of experiment where we just looked to see are there less or more pollinators in the city than outside of the city and it did seem that there was some difference there but this could be for lots of reasons right it doesn't have to be pollution it could also be because of pesticide use maybe fogging for mosquitoes it could be fungicides it could be temperature changes proximity to water or food sources all sorts of things so to control for this Gita who is an also so current postdoc in the lab decided to try to control for a number of these factors and choose particular sites in the city which differed in the level of pollution they had. And so what you see here is a map of Bangalore and these are the sites we chose, rural as obviously outside the city, and low, moderate, and high represent the level of pollution. And the sites we chose, we chose sites where they were not using pesticides or fungicides, where there was not a clear difference in temperature or humidity, and also where we could control as many other factors as possible, like the presence of similar plant species. In all of these places, we found this beautiful plant that I'm sure many of you recognize is called Tacoma Stands. It's a very common ornamental plant across India, and it's very common in Bangalore. And at this plant, we also find very commonly a native Indian bee pollinator called Apis dorsata, the giant Asian honeybee, which those of you from Indian cities will recognize as a very common uh, resident in Indian cities. It's called the rock bee because it builds these rock-like nests in the eaves of apartment buildings, and it's quite aggressive. So it's often actually dealt with as a nuisance, which is a scary thought to me because of course, it's not a nuisance. It's responsible for 80% of the honey for production in our country. So it's a very important pollinator. But we chose to study this species of pollinator because it's of its easy uh, location in cities and also its attraction to this common plant that we found. So the first thing we did was try to verify a bit more quantitatively whether there was a change in the number of bees we found at each of these sites. And indeed, we did find a, a difference that the higher the level of the pollution, the fewer number of bees we found. So you can see this on the graph on the left. We then did an interesting experiment. Gita is an, an expert in electron microscopy. She's become quite an artist with it. So she actually captured some of the bees and brought them back to the lab and looked at them under scanning electron microscopy. And when she looked at a bee from the low polluted site, this is what she saw on the, the leg of the bee. Okay, and I, this is the bee's knees, <laughs> as you can see. And what you see here is the pollen grains, of course, because this is a worker bee, it's a forager. And she was a foraging bee collecting what these are actually Tacoma stands pollen grains. And then we collected a bee from the high polluted area, which in Bangalore happens to be Pina. It's an industrial area. It's well known to be a pretty polluted area. 
And this is what the surface of the bee's leg looked like. And what you see here, this debris, this crud that you see on the surface of the bee, we call respirable suspended particulate matter. This is particulate air pollution. It's one of the most common aspects of air pollution, and it's the one most studied for the damaging effects on human health. We also have the ability to couple this electron microscopy with an X-ray spectroscopy technique called EDAX, which allowed us to identify what are the elements that these particles are composed of. And we found things like lead and arsenic and tungsten and cobalt and aluminum in these particles. And that was our first evidence that not only are these bees being exposed to the pollution, but they're actually physically carrying it on their bodies. So we then tried to look at what other effects might be happening. So we started to look at their physiology. So this is the heartbeat of a bee. Uh, insects have a neural tube and they have a heart that's actually this tube and it beats just like a human heart, although they have an open circulatory system. And this is what a bee's heart looked like under low pollution. And then we looked at the bee under high pollution and it looked like this. As you can see, it's also beating. The rate is not necessarily very different, but as you can see, different parts of that neural tube are beating at different rates. So it actually has a lot of what we call cardiac arrhythmia or our, our changing heart rhythm. And in fact, we found this to be the case with all of the bees that we looked at, that in highly polluted areas, they had massive cardiac arrhythmia. In fact, some of the bees even had heart attacks when we were doing our experiments. Their heartbeats would stop for several seconds at a time. So clearly they were undergoing major, major differences here. We also looked at their blood cells. On the left, you see a blood cell from a low polluted bee in a low polluted site B. And on the right, you can see a highly polluted site B. This, this cell is actually dead. And in fact, we found significantly fewer living blood cells in the bee's body. And as you know, blood cells are, are, are immensely important for their immune system and also for circulation and oxygen. And we saw a massive difference in the bees collected from highly polluted sites. We also saw a difference in the expression of many, many different genes uh, coding for things like cytochrome P450, which is an a, a toxicity uh, expression gene, or fatty acid synthase, which actually produces cholesterol, or tyrosine monoxygenase, which actually works towards the immune system of bees. So we saw massive differences in the expression between low and highly polluted sites. And perhaps most strikingly was the difference in the survival of the bees. When we brought the bees back to the lab, we would feed them and water them. And we would also see how well they were able to survive in the lab. And even with food and water, over 80% of the bees collected from moderate and highly polluted sites were dead within 24 hours. While we saw the exact opposite from bees from low polluted sites. So there's clearly a massive difference in the survival rate of these bees as well. Now, one of the questions, of course, is that these bees were wild. They were collected in the wild. We have no idea what their ages were. We knew they weren't very, very old, but we didn't know how old they were, other than that they were at forager stage. We also didn't know what they'd been eating or where they'd been flying or what they'd been exposed to. So we couldn't really be sure that pollution was causing this rather than some other factor. So to mitigate this somewhat, since we couldn't rear these bees in the lab, since their wild populations are very difficult to rear, we resorted to our good friend in insect science, Drosophila melanogaster. So we took Drosophila melanogaster that were reared in the lab, and we then put them out in cages in the same sites. And we put them out for 10 days at a time, and then we collected them and did the same exact experiments as we did for the bees. And we found indeed, as you see in the top left, the survival of the bees was much, much less uh, when from, uh, from uh, excuse me, flies was much, much less from flies that were exposed to the highly polluted sites. The expression of the same genes, of course, the genes are slightly different name in, in, in flies than in bees, but it was the same genes were changing expression. And as you can see from the wing images and electron microscope, the Drosophila, even from inside the cages, were, were also collecting uh, uh, respirable suspended particulate matter on their body. So all of these things continue to be the case.
So if you convert this to something that's meaningful, so for example, we measure air pollution by something called an air quality index, which is really an index that's created based on human health. It's not created purely by the level of pollution, but by the effect that pollution has on human health. So this is the air quality index for India, for example. Above 100, you start to have some problems. So if you create an air quality index for insects, actually, Actually, at the level where it just starts to get a little bit dangerous for humans, it's already very, very dangerous for insects. So it shows us that at least in flies and bees, insects are much more sensitive to air pollution. And now, I, since I'm talking to Plant Metabolism Conference, I want to bring this back a little bit to, to your, your organisms of choice. And while we didn't really look into the metabolism of the Tacoma stands plant, we did start to look at the electron microscopy of it. And indeed, we saw high levels of respirable suspended particulate matter on both the leaf and the corolla of this plant. And other research that has been done at Jonathan Gershenson's Institute by the uh, Department of Evolution and Neurothology, where I also used to be a project leader in Marcus Kennardin's group, they have found that ozone, which is another air pollutant that's commonly found, has profound effect effects on the volatiles that are produced by different plants, like in this case, this uh, uh, tobacco flower. And it actually changes the way the volatiles are both produced and released. And that can also alter how a pollinator like this hawk moth responds to it. So I encourage you in your own research, even though you may be working on, a, on an agricultural plant or a medicinal plant, to really think about not only the metabolites that are being produced, but how we actually might be having profound effects effects on those metabolites, how they are produced, but also how they're released into the environment, and furthermore, how other organisms respond to them. We are in a new age, and I think we have to start paying attention to our effects on the planet to really understand not only what, what is happening, but how we might be able to mitigate some of its effects. So with that said, I will just thank the variety of funding sources that I've had. I've been fortunate to have a number of, of funding organizations, both government and private, support our research over the years, and also the institutes we've worked with uh, and our students have worked with for this research. And I will thank you and take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you for a very nice and uh, informative talk. So, uh, Shannon, start like as I know already. Like I am uh, telling to all the uh, audience that uh, uh, when we summarize, like uh, what the previous talk which we uh, got from uh, Jonathan, it was about more about the uh, uh, specialized metabolites inside the plant and inside the insects. Here in Shannon's talk, we have uh, discussed more about how the specialized metabolism involved in plant insect interaction like it's like in the outside in run so it's uh, very nice thank you shannon like we will look what are the questions available there is one question from jyoti vadasari can you just read out pragadesh yes sir just Okay, can I put a question so that you can uh, ask her? Yes, sir, I, I have like just open. Uh, okay. So, uh, just, just a minute, sir, I am not able to get the questions. Okay, can I read out? Yes, sir. So, there is a question from uh, Jyoti Vadasiri. Regarding that, uh, the part of the alti altitudinal changes in volatile plants, how can you differentiate the effect of temperature variation when altitudinal differences in uh, volatiles are measured? It is something related to temperature and altitude, then and, and, uh, it is also related to the volatiles. Is there any changes at different altitudes? Can you uh, hear the question? I couldn't hear the question. Can you repeat I'll it, just read out. Uh, Dr. Jodi Vadasiri, uh, she's telling like a great talk, Shannon. 
my question is regarding the part of uh, altitudinal uh, altitudinal changes in volatile blend how can you differentiate the effect of temperature variation when altitudinal difference in volatiles are measured oh that's a great question i actually can answer that question it's probably a lot of the questions i won't be able to answer but that one i kind of can so what one one of the things i didn't mention in the talk was um so so mahesh is uh he, he studies this this is his field of climate change he studies a lot and he uh he often uses a technique called these open top chambers okay and what these open top chambers do is they can they can be surrounding a small plot of land and they can change the temperature temperature within that plot of land about one to two degrees, depending on the environment where they're in. So in addition to looking at elevational changes, we also within each elevation compared flowers that were growing just in the open to flowers that were growing in this open top chamber to simulate the temperature change that would also be happening with elevation. We did find some differences in the volatiles, although not as profound as the differences we found across elevations, which implies to us that temperature is not the only factor at play. But certainly temperature does have some effect. Sir, uh, there are other uh, questions. Is there same kind of effect on butterflies what you observe on bees? I, so, of course, we didn't study butterflies. So as a conscientious science scientist, I would have to say I don't know, but I would be really surprised if it's not happening because it's happening in bees and flies, which are completely different insect families. I would be very, very surprised if the effect was not also happening on other pollinators as well, or actually other animals as well, you know, not just not just on insects, but also, you know, birds and other organisms that are existing outside. So I, I don't think these effects would be just isolated, but of course, course, the exact impacts on the physiology of the organism would be unique to the to the, the group being studied. It looks like there are no more uh, questions. Venkat sir, is there any more one questions? More, one more question is there. You can just read out. Yeah, sir, I can read it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Abamina from CMAP, uh, she's telling interesting talk. Is the pollution also affecting the morphology of the insects? Insects link their flight heights, stings, and other fe other features. Yeah. So um, we did not observe any difference in the morphological characteristics that we were able to identify. So the weight of the bees and the, their appendage lengths and their wing morphology, as far as we could tell, there was no significant impacts in the in the morphology of the bees. Now, of course, we didn't look at every possible parameter, so there may have been something that that we was changing. But as far as our the gross morphology that we looked at, we did not see differences. Um, However, we did see, of course, obstruction of various uh, organs, such as the spiracles that they use to breathe with um, in, in, in the uh, highly polluted bees. So that obviously did have some, some effect on, on, on them. So, yeah. Shannon, uh, I have a question. Uh, whether we have found uh, any other behavioral changes in the bees, like uh, did we study that? Yeah, so so like uh, we did find, yeah, so so we, we did look at um the not only their visitation behavior, but also uh you know how long they spent at the different um the different uh, uh, plants. And we found that in the highly polluted region that the the bees spend a lot longer at the flowers than they did in other locations. So we, we then uh, did a, a, an experiment where we measured the nectar content of the flowers to see if maybe there was a difference in the nectar. And we did not observe any major difference in the quantity of nectar. We did not, however, do a, a, a qualitative study on what whether the sugar content and other factors were also different. So this is a really open area of research that um, I, maybe someone at CMAP or someone 
anyone else would like to take on because we're not plant experts in our lab, as you know, Pragadish. We, we do have chemistry knowledge, but not really a lot, good knowledge of plants. So we would love if, if, uh, if another organization would like to take this research up. I think there's a lot of scope to, to study the effect on plants as well. Yeah, it will be, it will be interesting to study the effect of uh, pollution on plants too. Like whether the volatile emission, well, like how it affects, and uh, that will be a, like a very good exciting area to study. Yeah. Uh, Vinkit sir, uh, any more questions? I think there is a last question. Can you able to see? I am just uh, looking. Uh, someone, uh, Ambika. She's telling, ma'am, if a pollinator is attracted towards a particular marker volatile and if it is not getting emitted in proper amount, then the pollinator won't be attracted. Attracted toward the toward the plant. Am I right? So she's asking whether like uh, if there is a particular marker uh, uh, volatile which attracts the particular uh, pollinator and uh, if that is not there then it will not uh, attract the pollinator. Yes, so so actually the last study I mentioned, which is not our own lab, but uh, but Marcus Canardin's lab in, in Jena at Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, they actually studied this. So, so for example, these hawk moths are attracted to particular volatiles in Nicotiana. You're absolutely right. So, so, uh, so when the ozone altered the blend, they weren't attracted anymore. How, however, the moths can learn. So it's important to remember that, you know, that these insects are not machines that just do the same thing all the time, but they do learn. So what they also showed was that even though the moths were not initially attracted to these blends because the chemicals had been altered, they were able to learn this new blend and then eventually they were attracted to it, even though it was ozone altered. So, so this is also important to remember that it, there is a potential that the animals can adapt to these changing volatiles. And that's a really interesting area of study as well. I hope there are uh, no more questions. Um, thank you, Shannon. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, sure. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now, now we have the selected talks from the abstract submission. Um, the first talk, uh, Dr. Varun Divedi. Uh, Dr. Varun Divedi is going to talk on functional characterization of defense responsive terpene synthesis from potato, solanum tuberosum. Dr. Uh, Varun Divedi, he completed his PhD from uh, CSIR CMAP, Research Center Bangalore. And now he is working as a postdoc. Uh, Varun, please. Uh, am I audible? Yes, Varun. Varun? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you put your slides on presentation mode? No, you just unshare and again you unshare, put it in presentation mode.
then come back to MS Teams, then share. Oh, it is coming. No, no. Please unshare and open the slides in presentation mode. Use Alt tab to come back to MS Teams. Then you can share. Varun, uh, try to complete your presentation in uh, eight minutes. Okay. We are running out of time. Share desktop, okay. Can we go with the second uh, presenter by the time you can uh, fix it? Okay, uh, I will. Uh, now it is coming or not? That I, I want to ask. Means no, it's not, no, no, it's not, not coming. coming yet. I think you have uh, not shared shared desktop. Okay, so I will. Uh, yeah, you can continue to second talk. I will fix that in the meantime. Yeah. Pradesh, you can request any. Uh, Varun, uh, we will uh, request the second uh, participant uh, by the time you get it. Then, um, Mr. Penil Parma? It should be in presentation mode. You please unshare Fenil. Can you please unshare? Then open your presentation in
Uh, minimize the screen. Can it? Yeah, you can open your PowerPoint. Pragdish, shall we go ahead? Yes, sir. I think Fine. we can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The our uh, uh, speaker now is uh, Mr. Penil Palmer from MG Science Institute, Ahmedabad, uh, India. Uh, he is going to talk on isolation and identification of microorganisms causing spoilage of pomegranate. Please, Penil Palmer. Can you can start now. Varun, please unshare your slides. Varun. Fenel, please share your slides. Are you able to listen us? Penel. Pragadesh. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Penel. You can start now, Penel. Okay, you can start and uh, start presenting, Penel. Your slides are coming. Yeah, yeah, no problem. You can go ahead. Yeah. You can minimize that uh, window. Penil, you can minimize that window. No, you can you can start now. Can you uh, let the window to be there? Uh, you try to finish your presentation in seven minutes. The other session participants are waiting. Can you unmute your mic? Unmute your uh, mic. No, he's unmute only, but uh, we are not able to listen him. Or can we okay? Can we try with Varun again? No. Yes, sir. Huh? Looks yeah. yeah. Okay, right. Uh, Fenil, I, I I think you can unshare your slides. We'll come back to you once the first presenter is done. Okay. When that, uh, uh, I think yeah. uh, we are running uh, uh, late. Uh, okay. So what we'll do is we'll start the other session. 
okay. and these two presenters can be like uh, added there as a zoom presenters okay, okay. Yes, because other other speakers in the other session they are waiting for long okay okay fine okay yeah so uh, venil and uh, varun you will be given opportunity in the next session okay so, sorry because we have to go to the other session so all the attendees may leave this session and uh, join the next session Thank you. 